Lakshmi Tantra Chapter 16 Elaboration of the Methods to Attain Ultimate Truth Now listen attentively, O Chakra, to my description of Mahat, the first disturbance or activity in the tranquil equilibrium of the gunas. When all three gunas are present in equal proportion, the cosmic principle containing them is called prakriti. When that balance is disturbed for the first time, the same principle is called mahat. It too has three aspects. The sattva aspect, which is buddhi, intellect. The rajas aspect, prana, life energy and the Thomas aspect, Kala, time. Now hear me explain these. Buddhi is the incentive to Adyavasaya, mental effort. Prana is the incentive to Prayatna, persevering effort. And Kala is the incentive to Kalana, doing, making, effecting. Ahankara results from a modification of Mahat. Ahankara also has three aspects, resulting from the proportional difference in the gunas. The five tanmatras, element principles, akasha, space, air, fire, water, and earth, are evolved from its tamasic aspect. The cognitive senses owe their origin to predominance of the sattvic aspect of ahankar. The conative senses to predominance of its rajasic aspect. While ubhayatmaka, the mind, originates from both its sattvic and rajasic aspects. This is how the tattvas, cosmic principles, exist. Among these, only eternal prakriti is the source of all, and not an effect. The other seven tattvas, starting from Mahat, have aspects of both the source and the effect. The modifications of the five tanmatras, element principles, akash, etc., the cognitive and conative senses, together with the mind, these sixteen are referred to by scholars as being mere effects. These are the twenty-four tattvas, cosmic principles. O slayer of Vritra, I have already dealt with other details and peculiarities relevant to these. O king of the gods, I have told you about this avyakta, unmanifested prakriti, along with its own twenty-three modifications. This prakriti, consisting of both manifest and unmanifest objects, is characterized as karya, continuously producing effects. Chit Shakti differs from this. It is imperishable, and the wise who are versed in the scriptures dealing with the categories call it jiva, the individual soul. In essence, this is pure, unmodifiable, unchangeable, concentrated consciousness, eternal, endless, and unlimited. The jivas, prakriti and purusha, though by nature unattached, appear to be connected and are even higher than mahat, the highest. Both these eternal realities are identifiable as linga, indicatory marks, and at the same time are alinga, devoid of any mark. It is therefore left for the learned to deduce their common characteristics by inference. Now listen, Chakra, while I recount their differences. Prakriti consists of the three gunas, eternal and ever-evolving, though it is undifferentiated, impure, and invariably identified with the jivas. 
It is also the unconscious material object subjected to the delusion of pleasure and pain. Purusha is the innermost ever-existing soul, which, though functioning, is uninvolved and is the sakshin, witnessing consciousness, the knowledge, and at the same time the knower, who is pure, unending, and incorporates the divine attributes. These are the divergences between the two. Now listen to a description of their nature. She who is devoid of positive or negative material diversity is unchangeable, ever active in creation, ever blissful, with a form consisting of all the six attributes, is in fact myself, Narayani, the Shakti of Vishnu, pure Shri. These two, Purusha and Prakriti, originate from me and will merge in me. Containing all these, I have evolved into various objects, and resting in Narayan, once again I become active in creation and develop myself out of him. Narayan is the unique Vishnu, the eternal Vasudev. Since he is not different from his Shakti, he is the one undifferentiated Brahman the great ocean of Jnana, Shakti, Bala, Aishwarya, Virya, and Tejas. He is ever tranquil and embraces the entire universe containing both static and dynamic objects. Thus Chakra, the science of Sankhya, the knowledge of truth, has been briefly revealed to you. The wise should first study the science of knowledge, Sankhya or ontology, which consists of the enumeration of the cosmic principles. Then he should master the knowledge concerning Charcha, recapitulation, derived from the teaching of the principles set forth in scripture concerning their common and divergent characteristics, their nature and source, etc. The true knowledge attained by the pure soul after mastering the speculative discussion on the revelation of existing reality is that Shankhya, absolute knowledge bestowed through my grace. Thus I have given you an account of the philosophy of Shankhya. After applying themselves to this philosophy according to the Shankhya system, these adepts of Sankhya attain my state of existence. The third method, called Yoga, will now be described to you. There are two types of Yoga, Samadhi and Sanyama. Samadhi results from practicing the eight limbs of Yoga, known as Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi, which implies existing in a state of identity with the Absolute Brahman, called Srinivasa, without having to return. This state is proper to those who have realized Brahman. It consists of intuitive realization based on the identification of the meditator with the object meditated on and arises through grace bestowed by me. Liberation is attained solely through divine grace and by no other means. Sangyama implies good deeds relating solely to the highest self. That again is of two varieties pertaining to the body and to the mind. I shall elaborate on both Sangyama and Samadhi. Sangyama consists of performing religious duties previously described by me. It generates pure consciousness by purifying the antakarana, inner organ. When the adept receives my favor by confining himself to good deeds, I bestow on him buddhi yoga, 
the realization of truth through mental communion with the highest, which further purifies the inner organ. As already mentioned, this is the second method called Sankhya. It eludes observation and is based on study of the sacred scriptures. When this last mentioned realization of truth takes firm root in the mind, it becomes as vivid as direct knowledge of the highest and gains my supreme satisfaction. Then I, recognized in my own form with my attributes and vibhavas, disclose that direct higher knowledge which is the outcome of discrimination between truth and falsity. The third form of direct knowledge comprised in samadhi is inviolable and firm, resulting chiefly from sattva and is largely due to grace. That other variety of the third method, which is described by the name sangyama and includes the pure enjoyment derived from three different sources, greatly delights me. There I, the soul of the universe, Shakti of Vishnu, the all-embracing, am worshipped directly as myself, or as God Purushottama, and through him as myself. Thus I have carefully explained to you the three exalted methods of attaining the highest goal. Now listen to my description of the fourth method, called complete renunciation. It consists of the adept's abandonment of every task, however weighty or trifling. Having been thoroughly burnt by the fire of worldly existence, he resorts to me alone. When with unwavering mind a person resorts to me, I permit him to identify himself with me, after his mind has become rid of all sin. <laughs>